seeing a, a major crash in the financial system. Most of the investment banks are bankrupt, and many of the commercial banks are bankrupt. With unemployment in the double digits, millions have lost their the homes. The breadth and depth of this recession that states are dealing with problems that are pretty unprecedented. But, I mean, did anybody, did it, does anybody think it's over? Anybody raise your hand if you think it's over? <laughs> It's fairly simple. 9-11 became the excuse to invade Afghanistan. Then the Bush administration convinced us that who we really needed to invade was Iraq. These wars cost lots of money. Where'd we get the money? Mostly by borrowing it. In other words, by selling U.S. Treasury notes and bonds or by simply creating new money. This drives the value of the dollar down. There is a common misconception about inflation. Most anyone will tell you it is the rising of prices. Rising prices are in fact the result of inflation, inflation being simply an increase in the money supply. The more dollars you print, the less they are worth. During Bush's two terms, the Federal Reserve increased the money supply in the U.S. by a whopping 50 percent, and under Obama, they've doubled it again. In the decade leading up to the economic crisis, the Federal Reserve and outfits like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac encouraged easy lending policies. The Fed dropped interest rates down to 1 percent, while the government practically forced banks to make dodgy home loans. This drove home prices up. Lenders bundled these loans and sold them to investors who hedged against potential losses using derivatives, a sort of insurance. This derivatives market grew, by most estimates, into the hundreds of trillions. All the while, American manufacturing jobs had been moving to China, leaving the U.S. with a consumer-based economy based more and more on borrowing and inflation than actual production. With war costs added in, this is a giant house of cards. All that had to happen was for housing prices to slip. Who got us into this mess? Well, the people that run the government, of course. No, not those people. These people. Do not arouse the wrath of the great and powerful Oz. L. Frank Baum's books about the land of Oz were published between the years 1900 and 1920. It is widely accepted that his children's books were a veiled commentary on the politics of the day and that the man behind the curtain was an allegory for the robber barons who created the Federal Reserve. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The great Oz has spoken. Who are you? Who indeed? The theft of American economic sovereignty by the Federal Reserve which is not a government agency, but rather a cartel set up by private bankers, can really only be understood by going back to the time of the American Revolution. It is widely taught in schools that the causes which drove Americans to split from Britain were taxes on tea, forced quartering of troops, and similar abuses. This is misleading. Before America declared its independence, Parliament had banned the issuance of bills of credit in the colonies with the Currency Act of 1764. This made colonial scrip illegal. In other words, England told America, you can't print your own money. Benjamin Franklin believed that this was among the primary causes of the American Revolution, something which he tried to explain to England's parliament. Founders like Jefferson, Franklin, and Madison were strongly opposed to the establishment of a central bank, knowing that it would open the door to foreign and private interests seizing control over America's currency. Jefferson wrote, I sincerely believe that banking institutions are more dangerous than standing armies, and that the principle of spending money to be paid by posterity is but swindling futurity on a large scale. This is Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton was the delegate from New York whose moneyed elite he represented. Hamilton supported friendly relations with England and fought to establish a central bank. Many of the founders opposed him on this, as did southern states like Virginia and Maryland. Hamilton's proposal involved the assumption of state debts by the federal government, which would be offset by new taxes. Virginia and Maryland had already paid off much of their war debt and didn't want to have to pay twice. There was another hot debate going on at the time, where to put the nation's capital. New York and Philadelphia were popular candidates in the North, but some founders were wary of placing the capital in either of these financial centers where corruption between bankers and politicians could take root. Finally, a compromise was reached. State stats would be centralized under a federal bank, and in return, 
the capital would be established on the Potomac River. Hamilton showed his true colors when he was discovered by then-President Adams planning a coup d'etat against the fledgling U.S. government. Despite this little-known fact, Hamilton's face graces the U.S. $10 bill to this day. In the end, Hamilton was shot dead by Jefferson's vice president, Aaron Burr, in a duel over a private dispute. But his supporters, the moneylenders of New England and Great Britain, got their bank. The charter for the first National Bank of the United States was due to run out in 1812. Congress refused to renew the charter. Almost immediately, war between America and Britain broke out. Many causes are given for the War of 1812, but anger over the elimination of the first national bank, which British bankers held a major stake in, is never mentioned. On the other side of the Atlantic, German banker Mayor Amschel Rothschild and his sons were quickly becoming a banking powerhouse across Europe and England. His eldest son Amschel in Frankfurt, Salomon in Vienna, Nathan in London, Carl in Naples, and James in Paris. Frederick Morton writes, The history of the House of Rothschild has been to an amazing degree the backstage history of Western Europe, because of their success in making loans not to individuals, but to nations. Napoleon was terrorizing Europe at the time, and Nathan and James, by far the most successful of the Rothschild sons, reaped huge profits by financing both sides of the war. They maintained a sophisticated intelligence network to stay ahead of the news, and when Napoleon finally lost to Wellington, Nathan had spies posted behind the lines at Waterloo, as well as a courier ready to race back to England when the outcome became known. When Nathan heard of Napoleon's defeat, he began selling government bonds, or consuls as they were known, hand over fist. Seeing this, the other traders were duped into thinking that Wellington had lost, and a panic ensued. After stocks and bonds had nosedived to a fraction of their price, Baron Rothschild began buying them up again. When the official news of Wellington's victory reached London, prices shot back up. It is said the Baron multiplied his already substantial fortune 20 times over that day. Some, such as Richard Lewinson in his 1937 book, The Prophets of War, have claimed that Baron Rothschild gained control of the Bank of England at this time. It is impossible to know for sure how much Nathan made, or what the family is worth, or even what companies they control to any degree of certainty, for the Rothschilds have always kept such information secret but there is no doubt that they are, and have been for the last two centuries, by far the wealthiest family in the world. The War of 1812 had left America's financial house in shambles, so much so that then-President Madison was persuaded to allow a second central bank to be established. It might be a good idea to look at what was going on behind the scenes at this point. The two richest men in America at the time were Stephen Gerard and John Jacob Astor. The Astor family is best known for its real estate, but John Jacob made his fortune first in fur trading and opium. Hmm, Gerard looks like he could use a hat. In current U.S. dollars, these men would have been twice as wealthy as Bill Gates. Gerard and Astor both held large shares in Hamilton's first national bank of the U.S., and after it was shut down, the two men used their influence to promote Alexander Dallas to the post of Treasury Secretary. Dallas used his position to push through a new central bank, which Gerard and Astor would be major stockholders in as well. The second national bank of the U.S. would not last any longer than the first, however, for in the election of 1828, war hero Andrew Jackson ran on an anti-bank platform and won. As president, addressing a delegation of bankers, he famously said, You are a den of vipers and thieves. I intend to rout you out, and by the grace of the eternal God, I will rout you out. When Congress approved a bill to recharter the bank in 1832, Jackson vetoed it. Why all the fuss? Why were men like Jackson and Jefferson so opposed to a central bank? Because the ability to control the currency of a nation is the ability to control the nation itself. In the words of James Garfield, whoever controls the volume of money in any country is absolute master of all industry and commerce. It is easy to see the danger inherent in this power falling into private hands when one realizes that with it comes the ability to create booms and busts at will. The present crisis was intended. Insider Richard C. Cook goes so far as to say, They did it on purpose. The housing bubble and its crash were engineered from the highest levels of the U.S. government, the Federal Reserve, and the financial industry. 
As for the crash of 1929, Ben Bernanke himself spilled the beans at a banquet in 2002. It is doubtful that the private owners of the Fed were ever sorry, however. These booms and busts over the years have all been precipitated for a reason, to redistribute wealth. During booms, wealth gravitates upward due to inflation. Even before a currency collapses, the damage done by a fiat system is significant. Our monetary system insidiously transfers wealth from the poor and the middle class to the privileged rich. Those who benefit the most are the ones who get to use the newly created credit first. And following crashes, the most powerful companies snatch up assets and competitors for nickels on the dollar. Lehman Brothers has filed for bankruptcy. Wells Fargo will become the largest U.S. bank by branches with an $11.7 billion offer for rival Wachovia. Merrill Lynch, the world's biggest brokerage, has been bought by Bank of America. Washington Mutual has gone under. The FDIC then turned around and sold WAMU's thrift banking assets to J.P. Morgan Chase. This hat trick has been repeated by the world's top businessmen so many times it is a wonder that booms and busts are universally perceived as unintended. But the truth of the matter is, nearly every economic crisis in American history has been engineered, and there have been many. Two factors contributed to the Rothschild banking family's success. One was their ability to take advantage of financial panics. Maybe more significant was their talent for creating alliances. John Jacob Astor employed an agent, Jacob B. Taylor, to make his real estate deals in order to conceal his identity. Nathan Rothschild and his son Lionel used the same tact. In fact, their American agent during this period was Taylor's own son, Moses. After Jackson shut down the Second National Bank, the National City Bank of New York grew to prominence. Moses Taylor, with Rothschild backing and by buying up shares during the panics of 1837 and 1857, took it over. Reorganized from the ashes of Hamilton's first national bank in 1812, National City's list of presidents, directors, and stockholders over the years is a veritable who's who of American finance. It was the first and primary investor bank in the Federal Reserve and remains one of America's biggest banks to this day, albeit under a slightly different name. A 1976 congressional report identified three Rothschild subsidiaries in the U.S. The National City Bank of Cleveland, the First City Bank of Houston, and the First National Bank of Seattle. Allegedly, the word city in the names of these banks is a reference to the city. The city is the financial district located in the center of London. Sometimes called the square mile, it is actually a sovereign state much like the Vatican and maintains its own police force. The city has been the center of world banking since the days of the Western world's first multinational bankers, the Knights Templar. 800 years ago, the Templar Knights built the Crown Temple Church there and made it their home and England's financial and legal institutions grew up around it. You can find the Templar Knights' familiar red cross on the city's coat of arms. For that matter, the Cross of St. George, as it is known, is also a part of the British flag. The city is home to the Bank of England, the Royal Exchange, the London Stock Exchange, the Royal Courts of Justice, and many other financial and legal institutions. National City Bank of New York was originally just called Citibank as was its sister, the Citibank of Cleveland. They both became national banks in 1865 when they received charters to print U.S. national currency. This was the same year that Lincoln, who had been issuing his own currency, the greenback, was assassinated. What was the difference between the greenbacks that Lincoln printed during the Civil War and the national currency banks like Citibank printed in their place? Banks had been printing a muddled variety of currencies as long as there had been banks in the U.S. Paper currency was ostensibly backed by some amount of gold or silver and loaned out at interest. After the Civil War, many large banks were allowed to issue a national currency for the first time. This was a big step toward the elite's goal of recreating a national central bank. Lincoln's greenbacks, on the other hand, were issued by the Treasury and were interest-free. The greenback threatened to cut the banks out of the whole currency racket. They killed him for it. Only one other president in U.S. history has tried to issue interest-free treasury notes. They killed him, too. America in the mid-19th century was marked by rapid Western expansion, and that meant railroads. In the decade between 1860 and 1870, over 20,000 miles of track were laid, linking east to west, and providing a way to move grain and cattle from the middle of the continent to the growing cities. All of this development required capital. Investors were more than willing to make loans. 
not just to turn a profit, but to get their foot in the door of the exploding American economy. The Rothschilds were no exception. In fact, they were pioneers in the financing of railroads on the other side of the Atlantic. Another Rothschild associate got in on the ground floor of one of America's first railroads, the B&O, a man by the name of George Peabody. Peabody was taken under the Rothschild wing in the 1830s and opened an office in London. He quickly became the go-to guy for British investors interested in American ventures and dealt in U.S. and state bonds, canals, transatlantic cable and railroads, and even shipped steel to the U.S. for laying track. But Peabody and Company's involvement in the American Railroad would really shift into high gear after Peabody retired and turned his company over to his partner, Junius Morgan, in 1864. The company was renamed J.S. Morgan & Company, and Junius' son, John Pierpont Morgan, backed by unlimited Rothschild funds, would become the most powerful banker in the United States. Not only is the Morgan name familiar to every American, so is his likeness. Alexander Brown was a linen merchant who emigrated to Baltimore from Ireland in 1800, becoming very successful. He was a major stockholder in the Second National Bank of the United States, along with Gerard and Astor, and his sons would go on to found one of the largest merchant banks in America. Brown Brothers had a London branch as well, Brown Shipley and Company. The Browns have always had close ties to the Bank of England. In fact, it is an unwritten rule that the bank's Board of Governors must always include a Brown Shipley director. One of them, Lord Montague Norman, served as Governor of the Bank of England longer than anyone in history. If you guessed that the Browns enjoyed close ties to the Rothschilds, you would be correct. In fact, it was through George Peabody's connections with the Brown family that he was first welcomed into the Rothschild circle. Undoubtedly, the Rothschild's closest allies were two German banking families, the Schiffs and the Warburgs. The Warburg family name is legendary in banking. M. M. Warburg & Company, based in Hamburg, is the oldest bank in the world and remains in private hands. The Schiff family shared a house with the Rothschilds in Frankfurt, the very house that Nathan and his brothers grew up in. Jacob Schiff first came to America after the Civil War and in 1875 went to work for Kuhn Loeb & Company. He promptly married co-founder Solomon Loeb's daughter, Therese, and took over the bank. Paul Warburg, who was regarded as the architect of the Federal Reserve System, followed in Jacob Schiff's footsteps, first marrying Solomon Loeb's other daughter, Nina, and then joining Kuhn and Loeb when he too came to America in 1902. Warburg was chairman of his own bank, the Bank of Manhattan, and sat on the boards of many important companies, often together with Schiff. Before Warburg came to join him in New York, though, Jacob Schiff spotted two promising entrepreneurs and lent them his support. One would become the undisputed king of oil, the other, America's preeminent railroad baron, John D. Rockefeller and Edward H. Harriman. Rockefeller was pious, hardworking, and ruthless. He and his brother William formed Standard Oil together, and by buying out or forcing out competitors, the company at one time controlled 90% of the refining business in the U.S. Harriman was no slouch either. He would eventually control the Union Pacific, the Southern Pacific, the Illinois Central, and a few other lines, as well as the Wells Fargo Express. He also sat on the board of National City Bank of New York, along with Schiff. Jacob Schiff arranged the financing for both the Harriman and Rockefeller empires, either through Kuhn and Loeb or National City Bank of Cleveland. The Rockefellers dabbled in banking, too. William Rockefeller and his son Percy were both directors at National City Bank of New York, and William's grandson James would one day be chairman. The bank best known as a Rockefeller bank, though, was Chase, which was built up by John D. Rockefeller's son. Eventually, Chase would merge with Paul Warburg's bank to become Chase Manhattan, after which J.D. Rockefeller's grandson, David, would become chairman there. Oddly, these two New York banks were considered rivals, despite the fact that they were run largely by the same family. If the Rockefellers had a rival, it would have been Morgan. J.P. Morgan pioneered the merger. He financed Thomas Edison's company and merged it with another electric company to form General Electric. He bought Andrew Carnegie's Steel Corporation and combined it with others to create U.S. Steel. In the early 1900s, Morgan and his companies controlled a billion dollars in assets, an incredible sum at the time. Which is why there was universal surprise when it was discovered upon Morgan's death that the worth of his estate was only around $70 million. A lot of money in those days, but nothing like what he was believed to be worth. The truth is, 
he was playing with someone else's money half the time. Morgan, like the rest of these players, was one brick in a financial pyramid, the top tier of which was occupied by the Rothschilds. With the addition of a few other bit players, this pyramid is a pretty good representation of the cartel that would form the Federal Reserve in 1913. But first, there would be a war. The similarities between the Spanish-American War and the war in Iraq are uncanny. Both happened around the turn of the century. Both were preceded by a well-coordinated propaganda campaign. Both were won quickly, but were followed by a long and painful occupation period. The U.S. was bogged down for years in the Philippines fighting insurgents. The death tolls of both invading U.S. troops and local civilians are eerily similar. Finally, both wars were based on a lie and initially supported by an American public which had been duped. While the robber barons were consolidating their control over American industry, several politicians, a Navy admiral, a newspaper man, and a lawyer were beating the war drum, pushing the U.S. toward war with Spain, which still held possessions in the Caribbean. You might think of them as the neoconservatives of a hundred years ago. A couple of these men are worth taking a quick look at. The leader of this group was Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt helped drum up support for war with fiery speeches, while he and Elihu Root led a campaign to modernize the U.S. Navy. Root was Secretary of War at the time under McKinley, and Roosevelt became Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1897. If you were wondering if these men were connected in any way to the bankers and tycoons we've been talking about, Elihu Root was their lawyer. He personally handled the legal affairs of J.P. Morgan, E.H. Harriman, and other powerful men, constantly running back and forth between Washington and New York. The Spanish were no saints, and an independence movement had sprung up in Cuba. The rebellion became more belligerent with U.S. backing, and Spain responded by throwing Cubans into relocation camps. William Randolph Hearst, the newspaper mogul, ran stories vilifying the Spanish and their abuses. Reportedly, an artist he had sent to Cuba to record the alleged crisis wired back, saying there was nothing to draw. Hearst famously replied, You provide the pictures, I'll provide the war. In 1898, the USS Maine was sent to Cuba to keep an eye on things. Three weeks later, an explosion sent the Maine, along with 260 American sailors, to the bottom of Havana Harbor. Spain was blamed and the U.S. declared war. Spain's wooden ships were no match for the newly modernized U.S. Navy, and the war was over within months. The U.S. took possession of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. Cuba was given limited independence, but the U.S. kept Guantanamo Bay for itself. As it turned out, Spain had nothing to do with the sinking of the Maine. It's unclear if the explosion was a simple onboard accident, or if the ship was intentionally sunk to get the war started. Either way, with its victory over the Spanish, America entered the new century as a world power. President McKinley was re-elected in 1900 with Teddy Roosevelt as his running mate. McKinley, who had resisted going to war, was barely into his second term six months when he was assassinated. Teddy Roosevelt assumed the presidency. Now the bankers, with their sights set on a central bank, had almost all of their ducks in a row. With allies in control of both American government and industry, only one thing stood in their way, the attitudes of the American public. Americans had become fearful of the great power that was being amassed in the hands of a few wealthy men. This was compounded when Harriman and Morgan, who had been fighting over control of the Northern Pacific Railroad, decided to set aside their differences and form a large trust. The Northern Securities Company, which Rockefeller got a piece of as well, combined several northern railroads under one umbrella. Teddy Roosevelt decided to attack both northern securities and Standard Oil for antitrust violations. These lawsuits culminated in the breakup of both monopolies. In 1907, while all of this trust busting was going on, there was a financial panic started by a run on the Knickerbocker Trust Company. J.P. Morgan intervened and saved the nation from a crash. What few realized was that before Morgan stepped in to stop the panic, he helped create it. Doctor of Law and author Ellen Brown described the panic and its significance aptly. The panic of 1907 was triggered by rumors that two major banks were about to become insolvent. Later evidence pointed to the House of Morgan as the source of the rumors. The public, believing the rumors, proceeded to make them come true by staging a run on the banks. 
Morgan then nobly stepped in to avert the panic by importing a hundred million in gold from his European sources. The public thus became convinced that the country needed a central banking system to stop future panics, overcoming strong congressional opposition to any bill allowing the nation's money to be issued by a private central bank controlled by Wall Street. This was all well understood at the time by some. In 1913, House Representative Charles Lindbergh, Sr. stated into the congressional record, The Money Trust caused the 1907 panic and thereby forced Congress to create a National Monetary Commission. The National Monetary Commission was formed to study ways to stabilize the U.S. financial system. The Commission finally made its recommendation after traveling around Europe for two years on the country's tab. What the country really needed was, can you guess? A central bank, which is no surprise the Commission's leader, the powerful senator from Rhode Island, Nelson Aldrich, held shares in New York's biggest banks. His daughter, Abby, married John D. Rockefeller, Jr. Yes, Nelson Aldrich was David Rockefeller's grandfather. What about Teddy Roosevelt? Where did his loyalties lie? Roosevelt, like his fifth cousin Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was from a wealthy Dutch family who were connected by marriage to the Astors. The Roosevelt, Delano, and Astor families literally intertwine like threads in a rug. Like the Astors, the Roosevelts held large tracts of land in Manhattan, which Teddy's great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, Klaus van Roosevelt, purchased back when New York was still a Dutch colony. Roosevelt was known to be a Morgan man, was friends with Edward Harriman, and had accepted campaign contributions from Rockefeller. Both Roosevelt and his longtime friend and Secretary of State, Elihu Root, help further the agenda of the money trust in many ways. So if Roosevelt was on the side of the bankers, why did he attack Standard Oil and Northern Securities? There is only one reasonable explanation. It was a ploy to allay public fears. It convinced the nation that the politicians were on the side of the people and that the power of the monopolists had been checked. Nothing could have been further from the truth. Rockefeller was hardly inconvenienced by the attack. The 34 small pieces the Supreme Court broke Standard Oil up into were still Rockefeller-controlled companies. The family stock values doubled with the restructuring, and four of those new companies would later become Exxon, Mobil, Chevron, and Amico. Hmm. I don't think Jefferson, who rallied against central banking at America's inception, or Lincoln, who tried to free the American people from debt-based privately issued currency, or Washington, who warned against unnecessary wars and foreign entanglements, are much too happy to have Teddy Roosevelt sitting up there with them on Mount Rushmore. Roosevelt's trust-busting accomplished one other thing. It kept the spotlight off of what the bankers were really up to. In 1910, seven men got on a train headed for Jekyll Island, Georgia, ostensibly to do some duck hunting. Nelson Aldridge was among them, as was Paul Warburg, and representatives of the Rockefeller and Morgan banking interests. Also there was Abram Andrews, the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. The men took precautions to ensure complete secrecy and referred to each other only by their first names. Over the next ten days, they hammered out the details of what would become the Federal Reserve System. The proposal was originally introduced in Congress as the Aldrich Plan, but was shot down. Paul Warburg rewrote it under the name the Federal Reserve Act, which Senator Aldridge publicly opposed to try and fool the other congressmen. The two bills were essentially the same. Lest we forget who was ultimately behind this, an agent of Brown Brothers, Colonel Alicia Garrison, wrote in his 1931 book, Roosevelt, Wilson, and the Federal Reserve Law. Paul Warburg is the man who got the Federal Reserve Act together after the Aldridge plan aroused such nationwide resentment and opposition. The mastermind of both plans, was Baron Alfred Rothschild of London. The act passed the House and Senate in late December of 1913, and the differences were hammered out while most congressmen were out of town for the holidays. It is debatable whether Woodrow Wilson, who signed the bill the next day, fully understood the nature of what he was a party to, or if he was simply a puppet. Certainly, Colonel Edward M. House deserves much of the credit for Wilson's cooperation. House's father had made his fortune running blockades during the Civil War and trading with British investors, including the Rothschilds. Colonel House was solidly in the inner circle of the Money Trust and was Wilson's most trusted advisor, maintaining a residence in the White House. 
Woodrow Wilson signed the Federal Reserve Act into law on December 23, 1913. Jacob Schiff sent a letter to Colonel House thanking him. Finally, the bankers had control over America's money, but that's not all. That same year the Federal Reserve Act was passed, Congress also passed income tax legislation for the first time, which would enable the government to tax people's labor in order to pay the interest on the money it would now have to borrow from the Fed. And it wouldn't be long before America would start borrowing like never before to pay for its involvement in a war. Arguably, not a single war in modern history has been fought for the reasons advertised. Most people think the First World War started over the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne. This did provide an excuse, but the truth of the matter is, cars, planes, and diesel engines for locomotives and ships had been invented, all which ran on oil. The demand for this resource was about to explode, and the Rockefellers, with their standard oil monopoly in the U.S., and the Rothschilds, with their control of the Royal Dutch Shell Company across the Atlantic, had the market practically cornered. Then in 1908, oil was discovered in Persia. Much of the Middle East at that time was under the control of the Ottoman Empire, who, in partnership with Germany, were in the process of building a railroad to Baghdad. This had to be stopped. It was time to kick the Turks out of the Middle East. <laughs> and this bull stating of the geopolitical facts of life strikes the modern reader with the force of revelation. For there is in our own time an absolute taboo among the corporate news media and the political class against mentioning anything to do with these strategic and economic reasons for war. How curious, for example, that the First World War is never taught in our schools as an invasion of Iraq. Not all of you are coming with me on that one. That's okay, don't worry. I will say many things in the course of tonight's show that you will not agree with. But I feel that if we retrench back to a position of consensus, we can build outwards from there. So going back to where I believe some consensus to exist between us, possibly. I am sure many of you, like me, have never been entirely satisfied with the standard explanation we were given at secondary school for the causes and origins of the First World War. The assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. I mean, no one is that popular. <laughs> A somewhat more efficient cause might be the Berlin-Baghdad Railway commenced construction in the years leading up to the First World War. The Royal Navy had just switched from coal to oil. German Navy follows suit, but they don't have no oil-producing colonies. Thus begins Drang nach Osten, the drive to the east, spine of which policy is the Berlin-Baghdad Railway. Now there's already track laid from Berlin to Constantinople, of course, it's called the Orient Express. The Germans just have to build the last 900 clips, it's going to take them clear into Baghdad, but there is huge opposition to this project among the major European powers. And the British, we're opposed to this for two main reasons. Firstly, we recognize that we cannot compete with the Germans in engineering terms alone because we know that passengers will simply not accept the Sarajevo to Basra replacement bus service. <laughs> Secondly, we know once this is built, ain't nothing to stop a Munich businessman getting out of the Baghdad terminus with a Deutsche Bank checkbook smashing our cartel. So a phony war begins. The first British regiment to be deployed in the First World War, the Dorset Regiment, goes to Azra, 1914, where it is joined by 51 other British divisions. Ah, uh, what a difference a hundred years makes. Not. Getting the European powers embroiled in a war was one thing. Getting the U.S. involved was something else. Americans wanted nothing to do with the war. That is, until the Lusitania, 
with 196 American passengers on board, was sunk off the coast of Ireland by a German U-boat. Evidence which indicates that the passengers of the Lusitania were sacrificed to spark U.S. entry into World War I, while regarded as the stuff of conspiracy theories, is well documented. The British use of merchant ships to ram German submarines had rendered civilian vessels fair game in the eyes of the Germans. This was well known, yet the Lusitania sailed into hostile waters without a military escort. One of the ship's boilers had been shut down, reducing its speed and making it an easy target. Despite claims to the contrary, the Lusitania was carrying munitions, which were listed on the ship's manifest. Germany took out an ad in a few dozen American newspapers warning that ships flying the flag of Britain or her allies would be attacked, ads which the U.S. government tried to stop papers from printing. Wilson's advisor, Colonel House, spoke with the British Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Grey, about the Lusitania the morning of the day it was attacked, recording in his journal that its sinking would carry us into the war. He was right. It did. War's effectiveness at pushing nations into debt can easily be seen on this tally provided by the Treasury Department. The country's debt jumped 900 percent between the years preceding and following the war. It ballooned more than sixfold again as the country entered World War II. But apart from the purely economic reasons for getting America involved in these wars, on another level there was something else going on. At what point in your career did you become connected with the Reese Committee? 1953. 1953. Yeah. And what was that capacity, sir? That was the capacity of what they call Director of Research for the Reese Committee. Can you tell us what the Reese Committee was attempting to do? Yes, I can tell you. It was operating and and carrying out instructions embodied in a resolution passed by the House of Representatives, which was to investigate the activities of foundations as to whether or not these activities could justifiably be labeled un-American without, I might say, defining what they meant by un-American that what we had uncovered was the determination of these large endowed foundations through their trustees to actually get control over the content of American education. Rowan Gaither was at that time president of the Ford Foundation. And um, uh, Mr. Gaither had sent for me when I found it convenient to be in New York Mr. Gaither said, Mr. Dodd, we've asked you to come up here this today because we thought that possibly, off the record, you would tell us why the Congress is interested in the activities of foundations such as ourselves. Mr. Gaither then went on voluntarily and stated, he said, Mr. Dodd, all of us that have a hand in the making of policies here have had experience either with the OSS during the war or the European Economic Administration after the war. We've had experience operating under directives. We are here operate on si similar, in response to similar directives, the substance of which is that we shall use our grant-making power so to alter life in the United States that it can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union. Well, parenthetically, um, Mr. Griffin, I nearly fell off the chair. My response to Mr. Gaither then was, well, Mr. Gaither, I can now answer your first question. You forced the Congress of the United States to spend $150,000 to find out what you just told me. I said, of course, legally, you're entitled to um, make grants for, the, for this purpose. But I don't think you're entitled to withhold that information from the people of the country to whom you're indebted for your tax exemption. So why don't you tell the people of the country that's what you've told me? 
And his answer was, we would not think of doing any such thing. So then I said, well, Mr. Gaither, obviously, you forced the Congress to spend this money. There's Dr. Johnson, who was then president of the Carnegie Endowment, telephoned me and said, did I ever come up to New York? And I said, yes, I did, more or less each weekend. And he said, well, when you're next here, will you drop in and see us? Which I did. And Dr. Johnson said, after, again, amenities, Mr. Dodd, we have your letter. We can answer all those questions, but it'd be a great deal of trouble. And we have a counter suggestion, is that if you can spare a member of your staff for two weeks and send that member up to New York, we will give to that member a room in the library and the minute books of this foundation since its inception. And we think that whatever you want to find out or the Congress wants to find out will be obvious from those minutes. Well, my first reaction was they'd lost their mind. I had a pretty good idea of what those minutes would contain. But I realized that Dr. Johnson had only been in office two years, and uh, the other, the, the, the vice presidents were relatively young men, and counsel seemed to be also a young man, and I guessed that probably they'd never read the minutes themselves. And so I said I had somebody, I would accept their offer, and I uh, went back to Washington, and I selected the member of my staff, who was on my staff, having been a, a practicing attorney in Washington, but she was on my staff to pre see to it that I didn't break any congressional procedures or rules. In addition to which, she was unsympathetic to the purpose of the investigation. She was um, level-headed and a very reasonably brilliant, capable lady. And her attitude of, toward the investigation was, what could possibly be wrong with foundations? They do so much good. Well, in the face of that sincere conviction of Catherine's, I went out of my way not to prejudice her in any way. And off she went to New York. She came back at the end of two weeks with the following in the way of on, on dictaphone belts. We are now at the year 1908, which was the year that the Carnegie began operations. And in that year, the trustees, meeting for the first time, raise a specific question, which they discuss throughout the balance of the year in a very learned fashion. And the question is, is there any means known more effective than war, assuming you wish to alter the life of an entire people? And they conclude that no, no, no more effective means than war to that end is known to humanity. So then in 1909, they raise the second question and discuss it, namely, how do we involve the United States in a war? Then finally, they answer that question as follows. We must control the State Department. And, they, and then that very naturally raises the question of how do we do that? And um, they answer it by saying, we must take over and control the diplomatic machinery of this country. And finally, they resolve to aim at that as an objective. Then time passes, and we are eventually in a war, which would have been World War I. And at that time, they record on their minutes a shocking report in which they 
dispatched to President Wilson a telegram cautioning him to see that the war does not end too quickly. And finally, of course, we are, <clears throat> the war is over. At that time, their interest shifts over to preventing what they call a reversion of life in the United States to what it was prior to 1914. At that point, they come to the conclusion that to prevent a reversion, we must control education in the United States. Yeah, I might tell you this experience as far as its impact on Catherine Casey was concerned was she never was able to return to her law practice if it hadn't been for Carol Reese's ability to tuck her away on a job with the Federal Trade Commission. I don't know what would have happened to Catherine, but ultimately she lost her mind as a result of it. After World War I, the Money Trust continued to consolidate their power, specifically to strengthen and institutionalize their influence over government. They did this by forming the Council on Foreign Relations in 1921. The Council brought together the nation's top leaders in the fields of business, law, medicine, media, and politics. Currently, there are around 4,000 members. It was originally dominated by Morgan interests, with the Rockefellers gradually assuming more of a leadership role over the years. Its first chairman was, if you can believe it, Elihu Root. The Council on Foreign Relations is essentially a lobbying body, but one which wields vast influence. The majority of U.S. presidents since Franklin Roosevelt have been CFR members, as has nearly every U.S. Secretary of Defense and State since World War II. Most congressional leaders are council members, and important cabinet positions are also generally filled from the ranks of the council. It's good to be back at the Council on Foreign Relations. As uh, Pete mentioned, I've been a member for a long time and was actually a director for some period of time. I never mentioned that when I was campaigning for re-election back home in Wyoming. The late Aaron Russo, an Oscar-nominated film producer who received but declined an invitation from Nicholas Rockefeller to join the Council on Foreign Relations, spoke about the organization. I had a friend, Nick Rockefeller, Okay, who was one of the Rockefeller family, and he, uh, uh, when I was running for governor in Nevada, he came to me, introduced himself to me through an attorney, and uh, we became friends. We started talking about things, and um, I learned an awful lot from Mr. Rockefeller. Now, I was definitely being recruited, but it's more subtle than that. Well, your word, just go through the process, and then, and then what he said. Well, you. well, what it is is, I, we remember, we were friends, and we used to have. He used to go to my house a lot, we'd have dinner, we'd talk, and he'd, he'd tell me about business investments that he'd get involved in, you know, and was I interested in joining the Council on Foreign Relations? You know, I would have to get a letter to join them, but was I interested in that? And, uh, you know, just uh, just stuff, you know, leading you on. And, and uh, I, I used to say to him that I never really did that because that wasn't where I was coming from. You know, as much as I like you, Nick, you know, your ways and my ways, we're, the, we're on the opposite side of the fence. You know, I don't believe in enslaving people, you know, and... Um, and he would come back with, oh, I do? Or? Well, it's more like, you know, um, how do I put it? It was like, what do you care about them? What do you care about those people? What difference does it make to you? They're just serfs, they're just people. You know, it was, it was just a lack of caring, you know, and that's just not who I was. It was just sort of like cold, you know, it was just like cold. And uh, we believe that it's best for society to be ruled by an elite people who uh, control everything. And I said, I don't believe that. You know, I believe God put me on this earth to be the best person I could be. And put everybody on this earth to be the best they could be. Not to be a slave and a sheep to you and, and these people. And I don't understand why you want to control everything. What is the need for that, you know? 
And uh, I asked them, do all the people in the Council of Foreign Relations feel the same way you feel? He said, no, a lot of them think they're doing the right thing. They think that socialism is the best way to go. But the people at the top, they all know the truth of what's happening. And, and that's what so, it is. So it's compartmentalized within the elite structure as well. Of course it is. Of course it is. I mean, all the people that, that are in the CFR, was that two, three thousand people have to go to, like Dan Rather, they don't know. They don't know what's going on. They just, they, they, they join the CFR because it's prestigious. They think it's good for business, it's good for this. You know, they don't know what's really happening. One of the CFR's most world-changing accomplishments was their creation of the Central Intelligence Agency. The CIA was formed after World War II as part of the Defense Act of 1947, a bill which also combined the departments of the Army, Navy, and Air Force under a new Department of Defense and created the National Security Council as well. This Defense Act was formulated by three longtime members of the CFR who also lobbied Congress for its passage. The first of these three men was James Forrestal, who served as the country's first Secretary of Defense. Harry Truman, who had succeeded FDR upon his death, was up for re-election at the time, and his opponent, CFR member Thomas Dewey, had been selected by the council to succeed Truman. James Forrestal met with Dewey, and they had agreed that Forrestal would stay on as defense secretary after Dewey's election to the presidency. But to everyone's surprise, Dewey did not win. Truman did. This was maybe the only time since World War II that the Council on Foreign Relations did not control the outcome of a presidential election. They made sure it wouldn't happen again, however, for after Dewey's defeat, the council has made sure that the presidential candidates from both parties were in their corner. Truman had ties to the mob, but was not a member of the council. He soon fired James Forrestal. Forrestal was later admitted to Bethesda Hospital for psychiatric treatment, and soon after fell out of a 16-story window. The circumstances surrounding his so-called suicide are suspicious. Why he may have been killed is unknown. Before introducing the second of these three men, it will behoove us to first fill in some gaps regarding the militarization of Japan and the rise of communism. After financing the Rockefeller and Harriman empires, Jacob Schiff turned his attention to Japan and Russia. Russia had long been a thorn in the side of the international bankers. Tsar Alexander II had sided with Lincoln during the Civil War against them, and the Tsars had long refused to allow Western banking to take root in their country. So the bankers began formulating a plan to end Tsarist rule in Russia. The right-hand man of Jacob Schiff in this endeavor was an explorer and expert on Russian and Japanese affairs, a man by the name of George Kennan. In the 1880s, Kennan traveled to Siberia, which served as a sort of penal colony for political dissidents in Russia, and began writing articles for the Western press and giving lectures across the U.S. describing the deplorable conditions in the Tsar's labor camps. Influential Americans like Mark Twain reacted with horror and became ardent supporters of political change in Russia. Meanwhile, Jacob Schiff began funding Jewish revolutionaries led by Leon Trotsky, pursuant to orchestrating a coup d'etat in Russia. Schiff's grandson related later that the old man sank about 20 million for the final triumph of Bolshevism in Russia. Paul Warburg's younger brother Max, who ran the family bank headquarters in Hamburg, also helped fund Lenin and Trotsky. But before a coup in Russia would be attempted, the bankers saw another opportunity to weaken the Tsar, which involved Japan. There's just no way around it. In order to understand anything about Japan, you have to know what happened there in 1600. In that year, after centuries of fighting between dominant clans, a large battle took place at Sekigahara, in which over 150,000 samurai fought. During the fighting, several clans switched sides, and Tokugawa Ieyasu and his supporters won a decisive victory. Ieyasu subsequently moved his clan to Edo and united Japan under what is known as the Tokugawa Shogunate. Tokugawa being the clan name, and shogunate meaning simply military rule. The emperor at this time became a figurehead. Three participants on the losing side at Sekigahara, the Mori, Shimazu, and Chosokabe clans, were ill-treated by Ieyasu and became bitter enemies of the Tokugawa. They would exact their revenge on the clan centuries later. Under the Tokugawa, Japan became a closed country. With the exception of the Dutch, who were given exclusive rights to trade with Japan through the port of Nagasaki, the country would remain off-limits to foreigners for the next two and a half centuries. The Tokugawa clan maintained relative peace in Japan until 1853, when the American Admiral Perry showed up on its shores with a fleet of four black-hulled warships and demanded Japan open its borders to foreign trade, or else. Japan went into a panic. 
Fearful of an attack by these strange people with their modern weapons, the Tokugawa decided to appease Perry. This set off civil war in the country, for the western clan saw this as a chance to topple the shogunate. They rallied their supporters under the cry, Expel the barbarians! Reinstate the emperor! Ironically, during the subsequent bloody conflict over what to do about the foreigners, both sides employed the support of the West, hoping to get the upper hand. France supported and sold weaponry to the shogunate, while Britain supported and sold weapons to the Western clans. After much bloodletting, the Tokugawa shogunate threw in the towel, and Emperor Meiji, a 16-year-old boy at the time, moved the imperial house to Edo and assumed power. Edo was renamed Tokyo. The newly restored emperor did not kick out the foreigners as his supporters had advertised. On the contrary, the Meiji government went on a modernization binge, building railways, factories, power plants, and warships as fast as they could. Military advisors were brought to Japan from Britain, France, and even Germany. Then Japan started flexing its new military might in Asia, fighting and winning a war with China. This made Russia nervous, and tensions were raised again when Japan signed a military alliance with Britain. Finally, in 1904, Japan attacked and declared war on Russia. Jacob Schiff immediately went into action, arranging loans to support Japan's war effort. Money poured in from Kunin Loeb, M.M. Warburg, Deutsche Bank, and the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, which had been set up by the British after the Opium Wars. Not only did Schiff make sure Japan got all the money it needed, he used his influence to see that Russia got none. Japan's decisive victory over Russia surprised the world. It was no secret that powerful Western business interests exploited Japan's eagerness to modernize and her thirst for conquest to attack Tsarist Russia. Political cartoons of the day attest to this. Jacob Schiff even bragged about it. John Hammond was quoted in the New York Times, commenting on Schiff's boastful statement that the money of Jewish bankers had made it possible for Japan to wage a successful war against Russia. George Kennan boasted about his role in taking down the Tsar as well. He arrived in Japan in 1904, just as the war was getting underway, and with the permission of the Meiji government, distributed anti-Tsarist propaganda to Russian prisoners of war. He was later quoted as saying that, as a result, 50,000 Russian officers and men went back to their country ardent revolutionists. Yet another straw was laid across the Tsar's back. In 1908, Jacob Schiff led a campaign to force then-President Taft to abrogate the U.S.'s long-standing trade agreement with Russia. Skeptics often submit that Jacob Schiff's campaign to topple the Tsar was merely a private crusade, but this is clearly not the case. In 1915, the American International Corporation was formed. On its board of directors sat some of the top financiers of the day, Percy Rockefeller, his brother-in-law James A. Stillman, and the president of E.H. Harriman's Southern and Union Pacific Railroads, Robert S. Lovett, all directors at National City Bank of New York. The company's founder was National City Bank's president, Frank Vanderlip, one of the seven attendees at Jekyll Island. Other AIC directors included Otto Kahn of Kuhn and Loeb, Pierre Dupont, and the great-grandfather of George W. Bush, George Herbert Walker. The American International Corporation worked closely with another important company, Guarantee Trust of New York. Guarantee Trust had been built up on the Rockefeller, Whitney, Vanderbilt, and Harriman fortunes, but by 1915, J.P. Morgan held controlling interest. Guaranteed Trust's list of directors was impressive as well. It included George F. Baker, Charles H. Allen, Rothschild Representative August Belmont, Harry Payne Whitney, and J.P. Morgan partner Thomas Lamont. The bank's vice president was Harold Stanley, who would go on to co-found the Morgan Stanley Investment House. In short, the bulk of American wealth and power was represented on the boards of these two companies. Together, they would eventually control dozens of multinational corporations operating around the globe. But in 1915, their first order of business was to pick up where Jacob Schiff left off and, in the final years leading up to the Russian Revolution, see to it that Lenin and Trotsky's Bolsheviks had all the backing they needed. Finally, in 1917, Tsar Nicholas II, weakened by George Kennan's propaganda campaign, humiliating defeat at the hands of the Japanese, and catastrophic involvement in World War I, fell to the Bolsheviks. The Tsar and his family were killed in a house in Yekaterinburg. Communism was born. How surprising that the second architect of the Defense Act of 1947 turns out to be George Kennan's cousin, twice removed, George F. Kennan. 
If you are confused by the fact that the CIA and their arch nemesis, Communist Russia, were created essentially by the same people, don't be. The Central Intelligence Agency was never designed to fight the spread of communism, safeguard democracy, or anything like that, despite the fact that the communist threat provided the justification for practically everything the agency did up until the fall of the Soviet Union. In truth, the CIA was created to do a very simple, specific job, a job to which intelligence gathering is merely incidental. Now, before introducing the third architect of the Defense Act of 1947, we really need to answer a few questions, which are undoubtedly nagging at you by now. What is it that the CIA was really designed to do? What is the real agenda of the bankers and organizations like the CFR? And what did Ford Foundation President Rowan Gaither mean when he said, as quoted by Norman Dodd, We shall use our grant-making power so to alter life in the United States that it can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union. And finally, who are these people? Is there a so-called Jewish conspiracy, as some conspiracy theorists claim? And what about that other group often accused of trying to run the world, the Freemasons? Do they play a role in any of this? We can answer all of these questions, and more. But there's a little more digging we'll have to do first, so grab your shovel. When Tokugawa Ieyasu granted exclusive trading privileges to the Dutch, he wasn't forming an alliance so much with Holland as with the Dutch East India Company, which set up their first trading outpost in Asia just after Ieyasu's victory at Sekigahara. The Dutch East India Company and its main competitor, the British East India Company, were the first multinational corporations. They wielded the power of sovereign nations on the seas and generated tremendous profits plundering the far corners of the world. When people think of these outfits, they think of spices, and while it is true that the Dutch and British East India Companies imported spices and tea from the east to the west, the most lucrative part of their business was the opium trade. A Dutch West India Trading Company was also formed to profit from the lucrative slave trade in the Americas. To put it bluntly, much of what these trading companies engaged in was licensed piracy. Another interesting fact about these trading companies is that they were dominated by Freemasons, from the investors and governors down to the ship's captains. This is evident in the numerous Masonic lodges which sprung up along the trade routes. So how curious that both pirates and Freemasons are associated with this symbol. The skull and crossbones is a prominent symbol in masonry. Here are some Freemasonic aprons. A skull and usually crossbones are also present in what is called the Chamber of Reflection, a room prepared for initiates undergoing the Masonic rite of the first degree in many orders. What few people know is that both Freemasons and pirates inherited the symbol from the same place, the Knights Templar. The true origin of the skull and crossbones is most likely the Chi Ro, an ancient symbol whose meaning is not morbid at all, but more akin to rebirth. The first Templar to fly the skull and crossbones, legend has it, was Roger II of Sicily, who harassed and plundered the coasts of Greece and northern Africa, and for whom the Jolly Roger is named. According to myth, Roger's father, King Roger I, copulated with the corpse of his wife Adelaide, Roger II's dead mother, and returned nine months later to find only a skull and crossbones. The original Templars were Normans, the blood product of Franks and Vikings. The order was formed during the First Crusade, and with special privileges granted by the Pope, they amassed great wealth and power, operated a vast banking network, and built hundreds of churches and castles across Europe and the Middle East. They also maintained a large fleet of ships and dominated the commerce of much of the world. The Templar Knights had a good run until 1307 when King Philip IV of France, who was deeply in debt to the order, lit on the idea of wiping out his debts by charging the Templars with heresy. And so, with the consent of the Pope, his men began arresting knights. Many were imprisoned and tortured, and some burned at the stake. Most, however, fled, mainly to Portugal and Spain, Scotland, and very likely Switzerland. How interesting that the home of the Bank for International Settlements, the Central Bank of Central Banks, may well have been a refuge of these medieval bankers. Author Ernesto Frere explored what happened to the Templar fleet, which disappeared from the shores of La Rochelle when the hammer of King Philip came down. He concludes, like others, that many Templars took to the sea after their banishment, thereafter adopting a life of piracy. 
These skull and bones decorate gravestones in a churchyard in Temple, Midlothian, an area granted to the Templars by David I of Scotland in the 12th century. Scotland is rich in Templar history, and some believe that the Knights helped Robert the Bruce win independence from England on the field of Bannockburn. So what do you think? Does the flag of Scotland really derive from the cross of St. Andrew, as legend has it? Or maybe from this? Author John J. Robinson explored what became of the Knights Templar in Britain after their banishment. Robinson makes a strong case that the Templars simply went underground and evolved into what would emerge centuries later as Freemasonry. Robinson is not alone in observing many connections between the two orders. Various Masonic rites belied Templar origins, and the Temple of Solomon, which served as the Templars' headquarters in Jerusalem, is a central feature of Freemasonry. Maybe the best clue that Crusader Knights gave rise to Freemasonry is that Andrew Michael Ramsey, a prominent Scottish Freemason during the 18th century, said so in a speech given at a French lodge. There was already a large Templar presence in Portugal and Spain when those fleeing from France arrived. There, the Templar Knights simply adopted different names. In Castile and Aragon, they joined existing orders, such as the Order of Santiago. In Portugal, a new order was formed, the Knights of Christ. The heirs of these repackaged Templar Knights, who were expert mariners, contributed greatly to the dominance of Portugal and Spain during the era of world exploration. Henry the Navigator was in fact a Grand Master of the Knights of Christ, and Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama, and Ferdinand Magellan were all associated with these orders and flew the Templar Red Cross on their ships. This age of exploration was Spain's golden age. And then King Ferdinand of Aragon and his wife, Queen Isabella of Castile, did something stupid. They heeded the counsel of reactionary priests and started the Spanish Inquisition. As a result, tens of thousands of Jews fled. In the latter half of the 16th century, profound changes were taking place in England and Holland. Holland, known for religious tolerance, was a Spanish possession when the Inquisition began, but declared independence in 1581 and eventually kicked the Spanish out. Meanwhile, in England, the Anglican Church broke away from Rome under Queen Elizabeth. To wit, the Catholic Church was losing its authority in these countries, and that's where many Jews fleeing from Portugal and Spain went. And there's good reason to believe that at least some of the Templar remnant there went with them. Here's why. The religious convictions of the heirs and descendants of the Templar Knights, officially a heretic order, would have been suspect in the eyes of the Catholic Church. The Spanish Inquisition was not just an attack against Jews and Muslims. Any deviation from strict Catholic doctrine was grounds for persecution, and rumors of the Templars' Gnostic beliefs and occult practices had led to their banning. The Knights of the Spanish and Portuguese orders had developed a fruitful partnership with Jewish merchants in Spain and Portugal, who not only invested in voyages to the New World, Africa, and the Far East, but also played a role in marketing valuable goods brought back. Queen Isabella, King Ferdinand, and their successors expropriated property from the orders while the Inquisition raged to help pay for military entanglements, notably against the English and the Dutch. Maybe the best indication that the Templar remnant followed their fleeing Jewish partners is that as the Spanish Inquisition dragged on, Portuguese and Spanish dominance on the high seas went into decline while that of England and Holland surged. This culminated in the establishment of the Dutch and British East India Companies, which both Freemasons and Jewish merchants played significant roles in. This notion of a Templar flight from Spain and Portugal to England and Holland is almost completely undocumented, but seems very likely and, if accurate, is startling, for it allows us to trace a continuous thread of conquering, plunder, commercial domination, and colonization. It begins with Rollo the Viking, who invades and conquers northern France in the ninth century. The Franks make peace with Rollo and his Vikings by granting them Normandy. A century later, Normans invade and conquer southern Italy and Sicily. Then in the 11th century, more Normans invade and conquer England. They are led by William the Conqueror, Rollo the Viking's direct descendant. A generation later, Normans and allies from all over Europe invade and conquer the Holy Land, at least for a time. This is when the Templar Knights are born. The Templars, in turn, dominate the commerce of the Christian world until they are banned and flee. From Portugal and Spain, they begin exploring the world and establishing trade routes, but are chased out by the Catholic Church again, this time fleeing to Northern Europe and England. There, they and the local Templar remnant, who will later come out of the closet as Freemasons, 
set up the Dutch and British East India companies with the help of Jewish merchants and begin colonizing the world. The thread doesn't end there either, for several American families got in on the opium and slave trade rackets. Participating in the opium trade, we have, predominantly, the Astor, Cabot, and Russell families. John Jacob Astor we have already met. Remember Henry Cabot Lodge in Teddy Roosevelt's circle of warmongers? His mother was a Cabot. The Russells we have not yet met, but FDR's grandfather, Warren Delano, was manager of operations in China for the Russell family. On the slave trading side, two other Roosevelt patriarchs, Johann and Jacob, owned a slaving ship, the Expedition. The Browns were involved in the slave trade before they moved into banking, as was George Peabody, who ran the Georgetown slave market. If you think I'm stretching it by alluding to a connection between influential Americans like these and the conquering Normans of old, behold the roots of the following families. Peabody, Brown, Roosevelt, Astor, Taylor, Root, Russell, Cabot. Remember, Duke William of Normandy invaded and conquered England in 1066, winning at the Battle of Hastings. According to houseofnames.org. Peabody, Norman, granted lands by William the Conqueror for distinguished service at the Battle of Hastings in 1066. Brown, Norman, granted lands by William the Conqueror for distinguished service at the Battle of Hastings in 1066. Roosevelt, Norman, granted lands by William the Conqueror for distinguished service at the Battle of Hastings. Astor, Norman, granted lands by William the Conqueror for service at the Battle of Hastings. All of these families, and there are others, descend from a Norman ancestor who received lands in England from William the Conqueror after the Battle of Hastings. What are the chances? You may be wondering about other key players. The Rockefellers came late to the world domination game and are not Norman, nor are the Harrimans. You wouldn't find a Morgan on the battlefield of Hastings, for they are Welsh. But they have their own pirate in their history. This guy. Henry Morgan the Buccaneer was one of the first governors of Jamaica, which he used as the base for his exploits in the Caribbean. How interesting that the Jamaican flag, like that of Scotland, is a saltire cross. But that's not all. Green and gold happen to be the colors of the Morgan family coat of arms. Obviously, Jewish banking families like the Rothschilds, being German, had nothing to do with the invasion of England. There are, however, some surprising connections beneath the surface. This is the Stuart coat of arms. There have been over a dozen kings and queens of Scotland and Britain emanating from the House of Stuart, and plenty of Stuart blood flows in the current House of Windsor. On the right we have the Hohencrest. Frederick Barbarossa of the House of Hohenstaufen was the first of a long string of Germanic holy emperors, and Hohen blood flowed into other royal houses of Europe throughout history, including the British royal family. Now look where the checks on these two family crests originate, the Jewish House of Cohen. I'm not just grasping at straws here, the elements in family coats of arms are not established willy-nilly. The Herald's College, for example, has been tightly regulating coats of arms in England since the 15th century. Cohen is an alteration of Kagan, which meant king or priest in Khazaria. Khazaria was a large kingdom in Asia, which converted to Judaism in the late 8th century, flourished through the 9th, and folded in the 10th. As Khazaria declined, two major groups there, the Magyars and the Kabars, migrated westward into Eastern Europe. Many, if not most, of the Kabars were Jewish. The Magyars, on the other hand, were really Huns, which is where the Hun in Hungary comes from. Historians invariably refer to these groups as Magyars and Kabars, and you'll never hear them talk about a massive Jewish-Hun migration, but that's really what it was. The leaders of the Magyar tribes were the Arpads, a clan which claimed to be directly descended from Attila the Hun, and who ruled Hungary for most of the country's history. Arpad blood also flowed into the royal houses of Britain through George, a Hungarian prince whose father was an Arpad and whose mother was a Russian princess of Viking heritage. George accompanied Margaret, an English princess who had been born in exile in Hungary, back to Britain in the 11th century, where she married King Malcolm III of Scotland. George's descendants are the Drummond clan, who not only married into the Scottish royal family as well, but became one of the wealthiest banking families in Britain. Two Drummonds happened to be the exchequers of the British Treasury during the American Revolutionary War and doled out the money used to pay for Hessian mercenaries rented by England from Hess Castle. This money found its way not into the pockets of the Hessian soldiers, nor their king, Frederick II, but into the pockets of the king's personal banker, Mayor Amschel Rothschild, 
whose sons then used the funds as seed money to grow the Rothschild banking dynasty. Rothschild is an adopted name, meaning Red Shield. The original name of the family was Bauer. An alternate version of this name is Bayer, and a Bayer or a Bauer was someone from Bavaria. If you take the blue and silver checks of the Kohan crest and turn them diagonally, you have the flag of Bavaria. The true origin of all these names becomes clear if you check the Scottish branch of the bloodline, Bower. The bow and arrow was the weapon of choice of the Huns, and this bundle of five arrows is an ancient Hun symbol. The Rothschild banking logo displays the same symbol. This topic is far too deep to really address here. Suffice to say that the ruling elite, be they kings, queens, or bankers, Vikings or Huns, Normans or Khazars or Christians or Jews, have been colluding, intermarrying, and competing for a thousand years to get control of nations and markets. This is why it is meaningless to speak of a Jewish conspiracy. Organized religion is for us, the masses, not them. They have a different calling, to rule. The word Kabbal actually derives from Kabbalah. The Templar Knights may have tried to pass themselves off as a Catholic order, but what they really embraced was Kabbalah mysticism, an ancient religious sect with occult overtones which predates Judaism. The dualistic nature of Kabbalah is represented in the interlocking triangles of the Megan David, which was used by Freemasons long before it became a symbol of Judaism. These are not Jewish temples, they are Freemasonic temples, and it goes without saying that the Templars and the other Crusader Knights were really the first Zionists, for they wanted the Holy Land, albeit for themselves. The Templars lost the Holy Land to the Muslims not long after they took it, but in the 19th century, two distinct Zionist movements sprang up pursuant to getting it back. One called for a return of the Jewish people to Israel, while the other hinged on a skewed interpretation of biblical texts known as end times prophecy. Some might be surprised to learn that there are far more Christian Zionists in the world than there are Jewish Zionists. One of the first proponents of Christian Zionism and end times doctrine in Britain was, interestingly, a Drummond while one of the movement's first leaders in America was Charles Taze Russell, whose followers went on to found the Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes, this is the same Russell family that made its fortune selling heroin to the Chinese. Samuel Russell, the head of the family opium business, we briefly met. One of the original Templars may well have been a Russell, for one of the nine knights who formed the order was a man known to history as Russell. This is very interesting, because another Russell of the 19th century Samuel's cousin, William H. Russell, co-founded along with Alfonso Taft, the father of future U.S. President William Howard Taft, an influential secret fraternity at Yale University in 1832. They named it, you're not going to believe this, Skull and Bones. Now we get to see how the Bush family fell in with the Harrimans and the Rockefellers. Many are aware that former U.S. President George W. Bush is an alumnus of the Skull and Bones fraternity. His father, George Herbert Walker Bush, was a member too, as was his father, Prescott Bush. It was at Yale University that Prescott Bush became close friends with Averill Harriman, the son of E.H. Harriman, who was also a Bonesman. But the Bush-Harriman family connection actually goes back a bit further. Prescott's father was Samuel Bush, who would have been George W.'s great-grandfather. Samuel Bush was general manager and later president of Buckeye Steel Castings, a factory in Ohio controlled by the youngest brother of John D. and William Rockefeller, Frank Rockefeller. Buckeye Steel Castings made munitions and railroad hardware, the latter of which it sold to an associate of the company, E. H. Harriman. E. H. Harriman's son, Averill, had little interest in railroads, and instead of following in his father's footsteps after graduating from Yale, he decided to go into investment banking, forming W.A. Harriman & Company. He enlisted his friend Prescott Bush to join the company as a partner and chose George Herbert Walker to serve as the bank's president. Walker was a well-connected investment banker in his own right who was one of the directors at the American International Corporation. The year prior, Bush had married Walker's daughter, Dorothy. Their son, George Herbert Walker Bush, was of course named after Dorothy's father. Finally, we get to see where Brown Brothers fits into this quilt. After the crash of 1929, Brown Brothers merged with Harriman's Bank to become Brown Brothers Harriman. Time Magazine announced the merger in 1930, noting that eight of the ten initial partners of Brown Brothers Harriman were all Skull and Bones alumni.
In the decade following the merger, Brown Brothers Harriman played a central role in funneling U.S. investments to Nazi Germany. Funds were transferred through the Union Banking Corporation, an affiliate bank set up by Harriman and an early Nazi supporter, Fritz Tyson. The recipient of the bulk of these transfers was the IG Farben Company in Germany, the corporate muscle behind Adolf Hitler. IG Farben was run by its co-founder, Max Warburg, at least until anti-Jewish policies made it impossible for Max to remain in Germany. Rockefeller's Standard Oil of New Jersey also helped the Nazis prepare for war, providing IG Farben with a formula for making aviation fuel from coal, for example. Standard Oil escaped any serious repercussions from their cooperation with the Nazis, but UBC wasn't so lucky. The Union Banking Corporation was busted under the Trading with the Enemy Act and its assets seized. Many accounts of the scandal sidestepped the involvement of Harriman and Bush, but UBC's offices were in fact located in the Harriman Building at 39 Broadway in New York, and Prescott Bush and Averill Harriman's brother Roland were both directors at Union Banking Corporation. You can find their names listed here on Vesting Order Number 248, filed with the Federal Registry in 1942 in conjunction with the seizing of the bank's assets. Another major player in the funding of Nazi Germany was the powerful law firm of Sullivan and Cromwell. One of Sullivan and Cromwell's important early clients had been Standard Oil, and the firm had also helped J.P. Morgan facilitate his General Electric and U.S. Steel mergers. Two senior partners at Sullivan and Cromwell during the years leading up to World War II were John Foster Dulles and his brother, Alan Dulles. Not only were the Dulles brothers instrumental in the transfer of U.S. capital to pre-war Nazi Germany, they helped their clients, Brown Brothers Harriman and Standard Oil, try and hide their Nazi connections, albeit with limited success. Alan Dulles is truly a titanic figure in modern American history. He ran the OSS, which was America's intelligence arm during World War II, and the predecessor of the CIA. One of his brainchilds was Operation Paperclip, whereby German scientists and intelligence operatives were brought back to the U.S. after the war. Dulles sat on the board of J. Henry Schroeder Bank, one of the original investor banks in the Federal Reserve System, and a bank which was also instrumental in Nazi funding. Dulles also served as president of the Council on Foreign Relations from 1947 to 1950. The prevailing wisdom is that the father of the CIA was Wild Bill Donovan. Donovan was an important figure, but the title really should go to these three men. In particular, the third architect of the Defense Act of 1947, Alan Dulles. Now that we've crossed that hurdle, what is it that the CIA was really designed to do? As the 20th century progressed, corporate America increasingly became involved overseas. The AIC Guarantee Trust Coalition was the catalyst for this growth, and they came to control no less than 200 multinational corporations involved in everything from the manufacture of machinery to international shipping to agriculture and mining. Frank Vanderlip stated, The way we conceived the American International Corporation, we had decided that what was needed was some kind of organization that would take a foreign business enterprise of great possibilities or even a good idea with management behind it and finance it into strength. Over the decades, the face of Wall Street changed as companies merged, changed names, and vied for dominance, but the model forged by AIC and Guarantee Trust, one of global commerce directed from select boardrooms, continued. By the mid-20th century, the scope and breadth of this commercial empire was reminiscent of that of the Dutch and British East India companies in earlier centuries. But there was a major difference. The Dutch and British East India companies did their own dirty work. They had gunships with which to enforce their monopolies. Corporate America in the 20th century didn't have gunships. They relied on the State Department to grease the wheels of international commerce, and diplomacy was often less than effective. That's where the CIA came in. It served as the attack dog for America's corporate elite, protecting their interests abroad. The CIA's first major operation was in Iran in 1953, ousting democratically elected Mohammad Mossadegh in a coup d'etat. The benefactors of this coup in Iran were largely British oil interests, but the CIA's next adventure, a coup in Guatemala in 1954, protected the interests of United Fruit, a company which had grown large under the umbrella of the American International Corporation. Another flagrant example of the use of the CIA as a gunship of industry was its ousting of Salvador Allende in Chile in 1973. 
Allende was killed and replaced with Pinochet, one of the most brutal dictators in modern Latin American history. The coup in Chile was orchestrated largely in response to efforts by Allende to nationalize the country's copper mines and telegraph and telephone networks. This threatened the interests of IT&T as well as the mining giants Kennecott and Anaconda Copper. CIA interventions and coups around the world between the agency's inception and the first Gulf War averaged nearly one a year and included meddling in Ecuador, the Dominican Republic, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Brazil, Greece, Iraq, Zaire, Angola, Bolivia, Afghanistan, Honduras, and Haiti. The most infamous of CIA-backed coups was in resource-rich Indonesia in 1965, where Sukarno was overthrown by Suharto. After the takeover, Suharto's troops murdered over a half million alleged PKI party sympathizers with the aid of intelligence supplied by the CIA. The tragedy of all this chaos and killing is compounded when you factor in that much of it was paid for by U.S. taxpayers. Hypnotized by the perceived communist threat, and clueless as to how big business really pulled the strings in Washington and Langley, Virginia. 